Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I discuss geocaching and my adventures with it. Hello, everybody. I'm here with Derek from Behind the Cache. Uh, he's here with us today to talk about creative and gadget caches. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell us, first of all, how you got started in geocaching. Well, that started back in 2012. Um, and it was actually my wife that actually got us started into geocaching. We were, my grandfather, we knew he was getting close to being, uh, passing away. And the, we were looking at a long road trip from South Carolina to Arkansas. And we we're like, well, what can we do? What would be inexpensive? And she found something in a Mac, I think it was a Disney magazine about this geocaching. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll try it. So at lunch, I ran, there, looked at, got downloaded the app. And at lunch when I was at work, um, saw that there was a geocache just down the road with like a block of where I was working. So I went down there and found my first geocache, which was a birdhouse, which is pretty fitting for me. Um, and really got hooked on it at that point. And then when we traveled from South Carolina all the way to Arkansas, we were hitting all the rest stops and really fell in love with it because generally when I drive, I don't stop and this actually caused me to stop and my wife really appreciated it because I wasn't flying past the rest areas and keeping on going and so it, it made the trip a lot more fun and a lot, a lot better for the kids so that's that's really how we got into uh, geocaching it was back in 2012 that way. So it seems like it, it started as a whole family affair for you guys. That's it always has in fact the Baker Six Clan which is our geocaching name was the whole the name actually came because there was six of us. I have uh, two older boys uh, from a previous marriage, and my wife and I have two children now. So there was a six of us. So it was Baker Six Clan, all six of us. Now everybody has their own, except my wife and I. So we're the Baker Six Clan minus four, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's just so it's always been a family affair. In fact, the our first path tag that we had made actually says Baker Six Clan established 2012. Oh, um, cool. is what it actually says on, on the, our first uh, path tag that we had made. Oh, that's neat. So after eight some odd years of geocaching, I'm guessing you have quite a few finds under your belt at this point. Well, believe it or not, I'm still under a thousand finds. And the reason is, is because I love the high favorite point caches. Um, I did a, a we got 365 days, which I wanted to get the 366 this year. It's later in October. I'll finally get my 366 day challenge, fill that whole grid up. But I end up having a streak of 92 days of getting caches. Wow. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, because, because I don't, like I said, I like getting high favorite point caches and, and, and take going to really cool locations. Doing parking grabs and getting the LPCs just really is not for me. I, 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 yeah. I'll do it, if, but it's, those are to me are for numbers. And so that's why I don't have a really high number count because I'm always looking for the really high favorite points and really looking for the adventure and really looking for the very interesting containers in uh, the different aspects of it that way. I see. I see. That's, that's still... Still a lot more than I have. I have 152 at this point. <laughs> hey, so. hey, and that's and that's and play your game. And that's the thing. That's what I really love. I've the most I've gotten in a day was 79, and it was because we, as a family, it was the day after Christmas uh, two years ago. Um, we went and did a geo art, and it was a lot oh. of fun. And now it's kind of started. I love my daughter to death because she goes, "Can we make this a tradition to go do a power run or go do a geo art right after Christmas?" <laughs> you know that's 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 great because what that's the whole point to me is what geocaching is is getting out and making memories with family and friends and doing that aspect of it so that's that's one of our traditions now uh, this year will be three years uh, lord willing getting out there after with all this covid but we i do have a, a power trail run uh, going from memphis up toward dyersburg that uh, looks like it might be pretty promising to go hit so we will probably try and do that this year, but that's that, that, that day is all numbers, but generally it's not like that for us. <laughs> so. Well, hopefully that works out and you guys can go hit that paro trail again and keep that tradition going. Yeah. Yeah. That's ho hopefully we will. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> <I can't>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, my my husband just I can't. He's just not into geocaching. Like he'll he'll tag along with me sometimes, and then my son kind of goes back and forth on. Right. And it it if I can find the larger caches that yep. he can get, what he calls them toy caches. Yep. Then he's into it. If it's like one or two, and then you know. They they humor me like my birthday and Mother's Day. It's like, okay, we'll go out for the day. What do you want to do? And, you know, it's usually like four or five bigger ones that I can find. But And I it, completely understand that because, yeah. I mean, caching with kids is completely different. Um, there's really a lot is. of different there's a lot of different aspects to that there's a lot of little things and one of the things that for me caching with kids that's been hard was hard is f going into what i call the ftf mentality uh when you're going out there and like oh there it is and i find it before anybody else does well you, i've just taken all the fun away from the kids finding the cash yeah and that and that's that's something hard for was hard, really hard for me to do it now half the time when i take them out I'll probably already have found the cache the day before. So when I go out this time, it's still kind of the FTF, oh. but I'm making sure one, I'm making sure that it's there. Yeah. And two, I let them be able to find it. And if they have a problem finding it, I can kind of help steer them in where they where it actually is. So there's, that's a little tip for when you're oh, that's a great kids. tip, especially with yeah. younger kids. Like my son is six. So it, it definitely takes him. I'll be standing there staring at it. Like, keep looking yeah. it's you almost there <laughs> yep yep and that's and another aspect if you do find like one of those larger caches and you go out a day early and you find it yourself and you know you're going to bring be bringing your kids to it you can always stock it with some extra fresh toys yeah that way you know there's going to be something in there for them yeah that's always disappointing if there's nothing there for them or they get a moldy toy or something. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We found a few of those before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We all have. <laughs> so can you tell us some about behind the cash? So behind the cash is a, my YouTube channel. Originally it, and it's really evolved over the last couple of years because originally I mean, there's people out there that are doing YouTube channels that go out and you're seeing them getting the cash. And that's great. That's, that's really cool. But I wanted to do something that was a little bit different. So behind the cash was always to me, okay, I want to tell the story behind the cash. So if I'm going to do a, say like the first video I ever did was actually through like a sewer pipe. And it was with one of my other uh, caching friends from South Carolina, Brush Boy. And it was very interesting. It was, I think we figured it up. It was uh, three tenths of a mile that we crawled through this oh. thing. And usually what I understand, it was uh, dry when I actually was talking to the cash owner. She didn't want to be on camera because part of the behind the cash is I want to hear the story from the cash owner okay. and try and find out why they did the different things. Well, come to find out, usually that pipe, every time she's gone to check, was dry. Well, we were wading through three to six inches of water because there had been a hurricane about two, three weeks beforehand, and it was all flooded through there. Oh, so wow. it made it very interesting. Um, should have taken up the uh, wearing the knee pads. I didn't. I didn't have any skin left on the, my knees by the time I got back out. But it was, but it was a great story. It was a lot of fun. It was something that I had never done before. Um, not, I mean, it wasn't, it was a drainage pipe, not a sewer. I mean, so that's, that's the good thing, but still didn't know what was in there, but it, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but always trying to challenge myself. So that was kind of how it started. So it started out really talking to cash owners. And then I, I mean, I always had the, one of the aspect of being able to do some of the gadgets and show how I built gadgets. And then when COVID kind of hit, uh, it, the channel really evolved into more of a, gadget build, creative cash build channel. Um, still, I'm looking forward to getting out there and going to get some other gadgets and actually talking to the cash owners because there are so many great gadgets and creative caches out there. And through the channel, I've met these people and they're like, hey, when you're out in this area, let's meet up and go do this. And that's, and that's what I really love about geocaching. It's the community. Yeah, It's probably one of the only hobbies uh, or other people call it a sport um, but it's one of the only hobbies that I know of that you, you can meet somebody out in the desert at 6 a.m. in the morning that you've never met before and go on a three mile hike and not worry that you're going to be buried out there somewhere. <laughs> so, and that's happened. I mean, I've met on um, one of my videos was called, uh, it was right when we were starting, when I was starting the channel, it was called Pennies from Heaven that I met 
uh, this guy by the name of John, um, and we went out for Pennies for Heaven out in the middle of the Arizona desert. And it was, it was a lot of fun, and it was really cool. On that trip, we got, I was able to get the oldest geocache in Arizona because it was uh, about four cents of a mile away from that cache. And oh, wow. like I said, it's just the community and getting to go to events and doing that aspect of geocaching is probably really my favorite part of uh, geocaching is really getting to meet the people and talking to everybody. Yeah, it, I have ran into a few cashers out in the field myself, and it's, it's always funny because you just kind of, you see each other, and you kind of realize what you're both in the same area for, and you just have right. this instant connection, and nobody else around you really has any idea why you're looking under a bush for something. Right. Ex exactly, and, and it's, I've always wondered, when <laughs> you're on a hiking trail, and all of a sudden you pop out, out of the bush, and somebody looks over at you like, did you just go back there and go to the bathroom? No, I was finding the cash. <laughs> so, I've, I've thought about that so, several different times with uh, popping right out of the middle of, uh, out onto a trail. And it's like, no, I was, I was back there looking for Tupperware or something or whatever. I was looking for a box. <laughs> <laughs> so when I think of creative caches, I think more of like a unique, container something decorative but from watching some of your channel that's not necessarily the only definition of it right and now there are creative containers and those are really great in fact <laughs> of course this is october and i'm part of what's called the uh cash what is it it's a uh, drives cash closet cash of the month well this month they sent me a finger oh <laughs> and inside of it is actually a nano and oh, so yeah. i'm generally not this is a creative container and i've kind of freaked my son out with it a couple times today but um <laughs> this would be kind of something this is a creative container the only i would actually probably if i did put it out in an lpc this that's what this would be i'd put this in an lpc and kind of freak somebody out but it'd go missing pretty quickly but that that this type of really creative container or another type definition of a creative uh, cache would be um, what I like is a cache that you have to solve a physical puzzle on the cache itself to gain access to it. So it would be where you're f f trying to figure it out like a, you could have, I'm trying to think, like a maze or a puzzle that would be on actual in there that you have to put them in place. And when you're doing that, it reveals a code that you would be able to put into um, a combination lock to get into it. So that's, that's, that would be my definition of a creative container uh, cache. But like I said, there are creative containers where you can do different things or they're decorated really nicely. And those are really creative too. So it's the, saying creative container, creative cache is actually a really broad term as well. Um, and it, as you get into, you can narrow it down a lot further and, and <clears throat> excuse me, in different aspects of it, just different containers. But my biggest thing is if it makes somebody smile and you have fun, that's really that all that matters. It doesn't matter the name on it, but there's, that's this, this is a lot of fun. Yeah. So we've covered what a creative cache is. So what exactly is a gadget cache then? So my definition of a gadget cache is that it requires some type of mechanical or electrical system to gain access to the log. So that could be a smart cache and a smart cache is usually using a microprocessor or um, some aspects of it where you have, can have to do something. I've seen some where you have to bring a lighter and you actually hold it up and have to heat it up, heat it up, and then you have to pour it and pour water into it. And then when you do that combination, it activates a the lock, unlock the mechanism to, so you can access to the log. Or I've seen where you have to solve a code on it. You put a code into a lock button, into a keypad, and it opens up. Or even a simple Simon game. You have to play Simon to be able to get into for it to release the uh, the cash or for it to um, give you the code to get into the cache. So, so there's a lot of different types of um, gadget caches, but I believe it really requires a some type of mechanism, mechanical mechanism or electrical mechanism to be able to access the log. Okay. That's a very good definition of it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with a lot of these um, gadget caches, are they typically like traditional type or do they get marked as like the the mystery type 
it really depends type. on the region and the, the reviewer. They can be traditional. Some people, they want them as a mystery cache. Um, it just, it really depends on the location and the reviewer and what they say. <coughs> um, so it really depends. It, way I always mark it, I usually do mine as traditional. Um, I have had a, a multi-cache that was a, a gadget cache, um, but generally I would mark it as traditional, but then use the attribute as a field puzzle. Okay. So um, one of the things I, I've said, and I was asked this too, um, would all field puzzles be considered a creative cache? And I don't think that's true either because you can do, I've done one here or a couple here in Memphis where it is a lock box that you'd have like on your house, like for like a realtor would put on the house and it's locked onto a fence or onto a, some type of building. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at another building to get a code or a clue to be able to get into that box. So that's, that's a field puzzle, but it's not a gadget or a really a creative cache. It's just, it's a, it's just a field puzzle. So that's kind of that, but I use the field puzzle because mostly most people that do gadget or creative caches or will have like a field puzzle attribute on it. And if they don't, they should. <laughs> so, okay. it helps, so if you're helps trying, narrows it down. So if you're trying to pinpoint a possible gadget cache searching by field puzzle attribute might help field, lead you to some. Right. Field puzzle and usually favorite points. Favorite points. Okay. Well, that's good So that's what I generally, when I go into an area, I'll pull up my, I use Cashly and I'll pull up Cashly and I'll narrow it down to, I want to look for something that's got 10 or more favorite points generally. Um, and then if I kind of start scrolling through, if I don't see a lot, then I'll kind of start knocking it down. And then if I know somebody in the area, I'll ask them, Hey, do you got any gadgets or creative caches in the area? And if you do, what are they? Cause like mine here in Memphis don't have a lot of favorite points yet. Cause I've, they, they still haven't gained all those favorite points yet. Mm -hmm. So, but they are gaining pretty quick, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're getting there, but I don't have a lot of caches out here in Memphis because trying to find places to be able to put them. It's kind of, it's really saturated here. When we're looking for a lot of favorite points, are we talking like 10 plus or 20 plus? Like what's your definition of a lot of favorite points? I would start looking at about 10 plus. 10 plus. Okay. Um, because like I said, a lot of people are just really starting to get into gadgets and creative caches. And about 10 is where it starts really separating the cache caches around the area from either from gadget caches or it's, it's just a really cool location. Um, and that's the other aspect of geocaching. It just takes you to really great locations that I really love. So on your blog, you've got a couple of examples that I just absolutely loved. There's this, you've got this shadow casting combination ammo can. It's a really simple, really neat cache. So could you, I, I did not do the best of job explaining exactly what that was. Uh, <laughs> would you mind uh, maybe giving us a little bit more detail and kind of talking about how you came across that type of creative cache? Okay, so that creative cache really came about from when I watch a puzzle solver guy by the name of Chris Ramsey, and he does a lot of different puzzles and different things. And he had this one cache, not, not it's not even a cache, sorry, it's a puzzle. And it you had to cast a shadow to be able to get you had to manipulate these buildings to get it into the correct way height and you had to use a shadow to figure out where it was to be able to open up this puzzle box. And I was like, well, that's really cool. How could I use that to create a creative cache that could be on an ammo can? And so what I did was take some bolts and drill some holes into the ammo can and brought them up. And then on, I did a half circle using a compass and I marked it um, from one, two of them from zero to 180 degrees and the others from 180 to three, 360. And behind each one of those degrees was a number from zero to nine. And what you do, what I'll end up doing, I haven't put it out yet, but what, what I'll end up doing is I'll put the opposite of what the degree is on that what's marked and they'll have to take a flashlight and shine it and whichever where that shadow falls will land on the digit for the combination for the code. So that's kind of way I kind of envision it. Now, is this the only way that you could do this? No, I have another friend that's got one's kind of similar because we're talking about it. And he's got one kind of similar to it, 
that you have to use a shadow, but it's his are all together and you have to, I think it's at a certain angle or you have to do something the way it casts it. I haven't seen his yet, but we kind of talked a little bit about it, but it's really, it's just a lot of times that when I'm creating caches and what I do on my, the vlog is really to get other people to really think about it and come up with some different ideas. I just, I love seeing what people come up with after I throw this out there. Cause that's really a lot of what I like doing. It's just like, Hey, here's this type of, this is an idea. Take it. You can use it, do it whatever you want. I would love to see how you use it. So that, that, that's really cool when somebody does that. Do you get a lot of responses for that kind of thing? Oh yeah, I do. I really do. And I've, and a lot, in fact, I've created, not created, I've, well, I have found a lot of new friends through, through doing this and people that just communicate back and forth. I mean, I've, I've met people from the Netherlands and I've met people from Germany that I've talked to that they see these different things like, Hey, how'd you do this? Or, and we'll just start talking and I'm involved with a lot of different Facebook groups. And it's like, all right, I'm trying to come up with an idea. This is what I have. And so we'll work together. We'll do some collabs on different things and trying to come up with different ideas. And then there's a whole bunch of other gadgets, people, creators, or as I call them, gadgeteers all over the place that we, really start brainstorming on different things and it's find out we're in different areas that, the, that these um, these are in and we really start it's just like another subculture inside the ge geocaching community that's just a lot of fun there's and we're all it seems like we're all really wanting to help and we share ideas and it's like we just like seeing how things evolve and so yeah there's a lot there's a lot more out there than you than you think i mean it's a lot of fun and it's, it's met some really great friends and really great um, people just going, just doing these gadgets. So you've got a lot of ammo cam videos. You've also got a lot of simple PVC creative gadget cache ideas. So you've right. got a, you've got a lot of neat ideas that people can just go to your blog and incorporate. And what I love about a lot of these is you don't necessarily have to have a lot of tools right have to have a whole workshop right and i and i try that's what i try i mean i have a workshop um but i also try and say you know some people don't have this so i'll kind of go this one you only need a drill or this one you only need a saw so i'm trying to create show that it doesn't take you don't have to have a workshop to create all these different gadgets or, or creative caches because it, it's really about the fun and just i i just some of my favorite caches are the simplest caches. Um, there, there's something about like, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of that? If I just pulled the string and the cache pops up this way, holy cow, how, why did I not think of that? And a lot of us don't have a lot of money that we can go and drop like uh, $30, $40 on a cache. And so that's why I was I'd like, the PVC ones are really pretty cheap. And a lot of those ideas was from somebody that I met from doing this channel. As, as he's out in Pennsylvania and his name's the truck and he gave me a lot of the ideas from for doing these PVC caches so that's just some really great another type of cache that's really easy to do um, the bird houses are fun and some of those will require a lot more tools that you have to do um, from different saws and different aspects of it and I have plans on doing getting back into doing some more birdhouses here pretty soon because I got to work through a lot of the scrap wood I have in my garage. Um, but just trying to do a lot of different aspects and cover a whole bunch of different types of caches for wherever somebody is in their building and creating cache uh, realm that they're in from the beginners to maybe more to the advanced. It seems like there's just so much you can do with these creative gadget caches. There's so many ways from simple elements to complex elements to even some deceptive, misleading red herrings to try oh, yeah. to make it there's, a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah, you can make it as easy or as complicated as you want. You can make it as easy or as evil, um, kind or as evil as you want to go. I mean, there's just a lot of different stuff. I mean, I've probably the most evil cache I've put out there is my patient's cache with all the different keys on it. Um, have I thought of w worse ones? I have, um, but <laughs> I haven't done them. Um, so those are, and it's just cause I, I would much rather have somebody walk away from the experience smiling and like, you know, that was fun. 
I enjoyed doing that. That was so much better than going to a, a light post and lifting up the skirt and like, oh, hey, there's a nano. Hey, I signed the log in. There we go. So, I mean, it's, there's so many different things and that you can do with them. And it's just really, I'm always trying to find new ideas. I'm always looking, I'll look through Pinterest and watch different videos on wood burn, uh, not wood burning, but wood, wood building projects and trying to try to get some ideas. There's one that I'm really wanting to do. Um, and it may be coming up in a video soon is a, a hidden drawer, secret drawer in there that you have to do something oh. and it pops out. That may be very soon. It may be down the road. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, I've, I haven't dropped one, my process, I don't usually write out the plans. Usually when you see me building a birdhouse on the channel, what you're seeing is actually me doing my prototype. I've been doing, trying to figure it out if it works. And sometimes I've always got the line. If it doesn't work, like, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. <laughs> so <laughs> and we'll see what happens. We, and all us gadget builders have the, what we have started to dub the shelf of shame um, where yeah, at least didn't work. This didn't, this didn't work here. Or this we'll see what this, and I have a lot of gadgets that are sitting on the shelf right now that I'm not completely happy with. And that's even some of the ones that I've actually probably a lot of the ones I built, on the channel itself, there's some element as I'm testing them that I just don't like. Um, so I'm always trying to come up with different ways and trying to tweak it before it actually goes out into the field that I know it's going to be able to go in a lot. I don't like having to do a lot of maintenance. Yeah. So that, that aspect of it is because gadget caches do require a lot of maintenance, usually if you don't have them working really well. So do you actually go out and when you get your your gadget caches that you do on the vlog when you finally get them just right you actually go out and you hide all these ones that you're showing us how to build or for the I, most part or i try to you try i to. haven't i've um i haven't built put out a lot of them um they're still requiring painting and especially the birdhouses because Trying to find a place to put a birdhouse is generally for me is really difficult, especially when I was in South Carolina, I knew a lot more places where I could put them. Um, um, with being here in Memphis, I'm starting to learn more of the places that I can. And I have a friend that actually is a reviewer. So I was like, okay, what? And he's looking for some places for me as well, because I always, the birdhouses I actually like having at businesses because I feel that they're a lot more protective and they're, they're at a business where, um, the business actually kind of looks after them and they're not going to be getting muggled or destroyed as easy. And that's what I had a lot of them in South Carolina were at businesses because the only ones that were destroyed were the ones that weren't at businesses. Okay. So it's just the safety. And I still have a few that are being watched over by some friends in South Carolina. And uh, so there, I get the logs on those all the time. And I just love seeing um, how those are. So you, you touched some on where you get some of your ideas from. You mentioned Pinterest and some woodworking videos. Where are some other places people can go look if they're trying to get some ideas? Obviously, your vlog is one of them. Right. Um, another one is if you can find different gadget cash communities on Facebook is another way. Um, finding them and just looking for type in gadget geocache or geocache gadget or clever caches and you can look at it that way. Pinterest, just search for gadget caches or uh, word working projects. Just puzzle boxes is another one you can type in. Puzzle boxes. Um, I'm trying to think. There's just creative containers. There's another section that you can look at. So those are different ideas that you can look at. Um, puzzle boxes is probably one of the really good ones. I mean, I've, you can get Cryptexes, which is a We've seen the movie Da Vinci Code. It's that's the, the that's the cryptex. Um, so that's that's another aspect that you can get, and just it's crazy. You can see different things in different ways that you can. I mean, if I go to like Hobby Lobby or to a craft store, I'll walk through some of the aisles. And I'm like, you know, that could be something kind of cool, or escape room. Escape room elements is another one that you can look for. And there's a ton of them on YouTube that you can find as well, um, or just go do an escape room. And there's a lot of different aspects in escape rooms that are really cool that you can use that, those elements to create a creative cache. That's cool. Uh, so what's kind of the best size cache to do a creative or gadget cache on? I mean, there's, I've seen a lot of videos. They tend to be either nanos or ammo cans. Are they kind of the best sizes for well, that? 
probably not as much nanos because nanos are kind of small, but you may have the log maybe in, as a nano uh, that you get to, or a bison tube. Really, you want it, the cache to be as big as it can be for the location. Because, it, and it also depends on what you're wanting to do in that cache. I mean, you can do, with the microprocessors, you can do a whole bunch of different stuff um, to can make it kind of smaller, the area kind of small where you want to use, but it really depends on what you want to do. I mean, if you need it in a birdhouse, you put it in a birdhouse. If you can do it smaller, you can do it smaller. It really, the location that you want to put it at really will determine the size of the gadget that you can do. Um, sometimes I've seen, or I've heard of caches, gadget caches that are as big as a um, picnic table and that they have to do different things to get into it. Or, and then I've seen some that are as small as say a lock and lock box, just a small lock and lock um, tup Tupperware container. It just depends on what you're wanting to do. Uh, and like I said, if you can make it to at the biggest that the cache can be for the location, and I think that goes with any type of cache that you, you can hide. The more fun, if you make it the, unless you're going out for an absolute evil hide or anything like that, make hide the cache that is as big as it can be for the location. And the other aspect of geocaching that I've really believe in is if you're not taking somebody to a location just for the cache itself, find another place because this is a location based game and you want to find those different areas that and some of my favorite caches are, haven't been gadget caches or creative caches. They've been places that it's taken me really cool aspects of it. Um, and that's, that's really what to me getting to see these different locations um, are really cool. Um, and if you don't have a cool location, put out a gadget cache. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, so then that brings up an interesting question. So what is, not necessarily what's better, but what is your preferred? Do you prefer to find like a really great location when you find a cache? Or do you prefer to find a, a neat gadget or creative cache? It really depends. I mean, if I, if something takes me to... A really cool location that I've never seen before then that's really great I mean I love virtuals because generally they will take you to a really cool location we have a virtual here in Memphis called the grotto and I've done a video on it and it it is probably one of the coolest virtuals and one of the coolest catches that I've ever done I wish I could give it more favorite points because um, it's like you're walking into a giant geode and it's just a really cool location. My parents lived here in Memphis for 20 years and never knew this place even existed. Oh, wow. And it's been around since the 30s, 30s or 40s time frame. And it's just a really cool place. It's in the cemetery. So you get your cemetery cash at the same time, but it's a virtual. And it's, it's called the, the Crystal Grotto here in Memphis is actually what it's called. But it is probably one of the coolest places. And it was a location-based. Um, another one, if I can find a gadget, those are great. I love gadgets. And of course I build them and all that. So, but it depends on, depends on who I'm with and what I'm wanting to do. If I would rather find a, I mean, I'm always up for trying to find a gadget. So, but if I, it's, but generally there, if there's not a gadget around or anything like that, I'm going to look for something that's got a really cool location. That's going to be really neat and something that I'm going to get to see that I don't get to see all the time and it kind of takes me off the beaten path and to kind of see something really cool. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. There's a lot of neat places that even just in our local area that geocaching has helped us find that I grew up here and had no clue it was anywhere around us. Yeah, it, it's like the saying that I've seen on in shirts that geocachers know where to hide the dead bodies because we know <laughs> where these really cool places are. But it's just... It's real. I just, that's one of the aspects of it that I really like. I mean, it's just, I've seen things geocaching that I would have never thought of, like, like the grotto or different, learning some different aspects of when I was at the Grand Canyon or doing, finding a hidden trail, uh, finding a park, finding these different areas just by geocaching that I would have never even known about. Yeah, that's, 
It's one of my absolute favorite parts about it. It's led us to a couple of neat parks and a couple of neat monuments and landmarkers that I had been within, say, 50 yards of and had no clue they were there before. Yeah, it's just amazing. I love that. It, it really is cool. That's it's probably, it, it's always neat finding what you're after. And especially if you've got like some sort of creative aspect to it or something, but just these little hidden treasures all around you that are actually the locations and the things that you had no clue were in your own area. And then doing them when you're vacationing, it can help you find great places yeah. that maybe don't necessarily show up in the travel guides. So it's it's right. just a really cool aspect of, of geocaching. And a lot of times you even find out a lot of the little uh, bits of history that you never even would have known about. And that's, yeah. that's, that's really cool too. Yeah, I recently, uh, it's probably been about a month or so, we did an adventure lab in our area. Um, in St. Charles, there's a historic downtown area, the old cobblestone streets and old stores, all these historic buildings. We'd go down there all the time growing up. We'd go down there all the time as an adult. I didn't realize there were all these little placards on the building that actually talked about what the buildings used to be back in like the 1800s and stuff. And part of the adventure lab was actually, you had to read these placards and answer questions based off of them. And I learned so much. And it's like, I've probably been to this building a hundred (laughs) times easily and never even noticed the plaque right there. Yeah. I I completely agree. The same thing in Charleston. There were so many different, different caches there that were like down an alley that had some historical significance that I wouldn't even known about unless that took me there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. So with hiding caches, obviously maintenance is a thing and a really important thing is waterproofing. (laughs) Um, Do you have some general waterproofing advice you can give to people that are maybe trying to hide a gadget or creative cache? Unfor- it's really hard. And waterproofing is really difficult because trying to find a container that can keep the water out for a long period of time is usually really hard. Usually it needs to have some type of seal. Um, that's why ammo cans are really good. Birdhouses are really hard. Um, but if you can somehow seal it, is going to be the best way. Or if you get inside of a birdhouse, you put a lock and lock inside of it. So if water gets in, it, it doesn't necessarily get to the log or the, the swag or anything like that you have in there. But the biggest thing is I would always use a right in the rain paper in there. So if it gets wet, you can still write on it. Um, so that, that's probably the biggest thing is make sure that the log is done with like a waterproof paper, like the right and rain paper, because Water has a tendency of getting in places that you didn't ever expect it to get to. Yes, it's just it the nature of water. And it also really depends on your location where you're at too. Because weather, having a cache to weather in Arizona is completely different than having a cache weather in, say, New England. It's completely different climates. Or if you're in snow, um, you put in these plastic ammo cans out in snow and it freezes up and you come and re- reach and grab it and it breaks. And so there's different, or it's frozen and your hand has, it's one of the metal ammo cans and it's frozen and you, it's got frost on it and your hand sticks to it. I mean, there's, you have to be careful with whatever climate you're at and there's always different things that you have to do. Uh, Wood expands to, I know somebody that coats their, their gadget caches and their caches in fiberglass and they're in Arizona and they'll last five, six years out in the field. Great. I don't have to do fiberglass. I probably ought to, but there's different, different aspects of it. It really depends the waterproofing of it. it it's really hard um, to do it, but the biggest thing is your logbook to make sure that's dry. So having that in a bag or in a some type of waterproof container is really good. And always, I would always have a right in the rain paper. I imagine with uh, like the smart caches that have electrical components. That gets, yeah, those are nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine that gets really difficult trying to waterproof those. Right. And those, what, I would, what I've done is I'll do like a lock and lock or where the, the components are, and then I will seal it with silicone somehow that the moisture can't get in there as easy. Um, but 
if the microprocessor goes out, if you can rehook up the micro wherever the microprocessor is, if you can have that kind of sealed in in a in a box and just have the wires coming out with silicone put in there, that's going to be the best way. So you can't it, that you don't get that moisture in there. So nothing is quite foolproof, but a lot of great potential no. tips to help sort of minimize the water damage per yes. se. So. Oh. Well, I have a question that this is one thing that always kind of, I, I never know what quite what to think. So there's a lot of micros and nanos in my area. And I have found a lot of times a nano gets marked as either a micro or sometimes it gets marked as an other. Right. What's your opinion? Like, is it, an, is it a micro or an, is it, is it an other when you go and mark yours? Well, on geocaching.com, they actually have the actual sizes that a cache could always be. Um, but it's always left up to the cache owner to determine it. Uh, and the other is, could be part of a mystery. So somebody doesn't necessarily want to reveal that they hit a nano, so they put market as an other. So you don't know exactly what you're looking for. It's just so they can raise the difficulty of it or so they can do different aspects of it. So that's... I don't know. It's, that one's kind of hard to answer, but if you can look at on geocaching.com, they actually have the sizes. So if it's a size of a D battery, which is basically the size of an old film canister, that is actually a micro. A ni nano is like the end of a pencil eraser. And then it goes, a bread box is a, is a, a regular size cache. And then, or, or a regular size cache would also be an ammo can. And then a large can, a large is actually the size of a five gallon bucket, which was the original like GC stash was a five gallon, five gallon bucket. So that's a large. And that's really how it's broken down on geocaching.com, how, how to determine the sizes of your caches. So that's, or actually then a small is the size. I'm trying to think, so I said micro, Nano, I didn't say a small. A small would be, um, I don't know. It's 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 a size in between the D battery and the the, the regular size, the bread like box. a softball or something. Right, right. So when you're marking like a, a gadget cache, let's just say, I I saw a video online of one where it was like this. I can only imagine it had to be a five difficulty level. And it was this <laughs> giant weird orb shaped mess of PVC tubes create a maze. But then right. it was like down in a bucket and it had bars across the top. So you couldn't pull it out and you had to try to somehow maneuver through these bars and get the, I'm not sure if it was a, bison tube or if it was a nano but you had a maneuver to get it out but the bucket itself was about a five gallon bucket right so that so would do be you base the size on the log or base the size on the whole contraption i base the whole size on the actual container itself that's holding the log so that would be to me that because it's in a five gallon bucket and it, the other stuff's inside the log with the log maybe in a nano or into a bison tube or anything like that. I, I judge it by the size of the container that actually holds everything. So if I'm putting out a birdhouse, it's going to be a regular size. Or if I'm putting out a, a ammo can, it's a regular size. I generally don't put out anything really small. I have one cache that's out. That's probably a small and it's marked as a small. So and it's just a creative container. Okay, so like in the, the case of the, the five gallon bucket, you'd probably get lark, you would probably mark it as the, the large size. Right. Okay. Right. I could I would either mark it as a large or an unknown. Just could it that would be between the two. But that might that's, be a, unknown might be a good one for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not actually sure what they had it marked as. I just kind of saw the the clip of them trying to right. maneuver this massive tangle of tubes and it was very impressive. But I that if that wasn't rated a five difficulty then <laughs> but i don't and that's know all and that's all judging by the cash owner because that's one thing i would building cash gadgets i always have a hard time rating the difficulty because i put it together i know how it works so i generally have my kids or somebody else beta test it for me and tell me how how difficult was it for you to get into so that's that's how i determine that because 
for me is building it. I've already solved it because I worked it out as I was doing it. So I don't know how hard it really is. That's a good piece of advice for anybody hiding a gadget cache out there. Yeah. There's a, a couple in my area I was given the, the GC codes for, but I haven't gone out to try to find them yet because they're between the two of them, there's a four and a five difficulty rating, and they both say take an hour to two hours to do, and my six-year-old is not going to hang out no, sitting no. there to do it. <laughs> so I'm uh, having to put that off for a little while, but I do hope to get out there and, and see what those actually are. <laughs> I'm quite curious about them, especially yeah. when they're like, yeah, you may need two hours to find this little micro. I'm like, Yes. What are you going to make me do that's going to take me two hours to find this micro? And it's a patience cache. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that's exactly what it said on there. This is a patience cache. And then I'm sitting there wondering if I actually have the patience to do it. <laughs> or if I'm going to say yeah. a lot of bad words. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little both. I don't know. <laughs> I hope to find out one of these days. But Yep. <laughs> Warning, this part of the show contains spoilers for the cash that is about to be discussed. So um, at the end of each podcast, we, I always do a cash highlight, and you have agreed to do the cash highlight for us. Yes. Which I do appreciate. So I will read that information and read the description for everybody here. And the cash okay. is called Freedom Go Boom. Cash ID GC6Z. C M K difficulty rating one terrain rating one. The description reads, this is a very unique cache. I can pretty much guarantee that you have never seen a cache, anything like this before. Countless hours and probably way too much money has been invested in this one of a kind cache for your enjoyment. Please read the cache page in its entirety before attempting. Like all of my caches, it does not need to be taken apart, pried open, or otherwise disabled. The cache is completely out in the open and can be spotted easily, but to sign the log, you will have to find the combination to the lock on the rear cannon carriage. If you have ever played pinball, then you should discover the canyon's secret post haste. Be gentle so other cachers may enjoy this unique cache. Hint, just pulling back and releasing the plunger will probably not make freedom go boom. You must snap the plunger as if you were actually playing pinball. That one is a really fun one. That's a, that's a great gadget cache. Um, and that's put out by my friend Geodoc out in Savannah. And it's, it's based off of some originally, because and I do have a video of it on my channel, but he, it was originally a, where you take, you have to take, um, your car battery jumper cables and hook it up to it and it would actually push the cannonball out. But oh. as he said, people wouldn't read the description page and they wouldn't reverse the, the, the cables to bring it back down. And he, he burned out, they burned out like five or six different motors on them. Oh, wow. So what he ended up doing is turning it into getting a pinball um, machine, um, whatever they're called for you pull back the, the stopper and, and sling it forward. And that, that was, so that's what he did. But what's cool about it, it's in his front lawn. It's right really? next to his, it's right next to his house. And if you actually go and get, get it, I think it's under, under maintenance right now. I was, I was checking it the other day. Um, but if you stop by and tell Ranger doc that you're there doing his cash. In fact, he's got a, a sign right there where it parks this for geocachers only a parking parking spot. And uh, you can actually, he'll give you his uh, personalized path tag and everything. And it was just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, really funny story is because when he was putting this cache together, he was trying to find how to make this cannon. And he just can't go, go and cast metal. Well, not everybody can go cast metal, but he didn't want to go cast metal to put this out there. Well, what it actually is, is a pillar that you'd go to Lowe's or Home Depot, some store to actually get to put it on your front house and he, he was looking around home depot trying to find something to put out and he asked the guy said hey this is what i'm looking at doing he's like oh i know what you need so he takes him over to the pillar and he goes that's a hundred dollars i'll just need two feet of that thing <laughs> and he ended up buying it and oh but he's my. like cut two he's like yeah five minutes after i bought it, i cut two feet off of the thing 
And I said, well, you got the other end now as a backup. But uh, <laughs> so, but that it's just really cool. Really, it's a pirate theme kind of canon that he did for uh, originally. It was for a competition there in Georgia for a cash building competition. Is what he did now, and it's in his front, literally right in his front yard, to do it right next to his house. That's pretty cool. So, and if you're ever in the area, anybody's ever in the area of Savannah, look up Ranger Doc's caches because he's got a ton of gadget caches in the area. And he's, there's a real, he's got a uh, travel bug hotel that when I was living over there and I'd be driving from South Carolina to Florida, I always stopped off at the travel bug hotel, even though I'd already found it and swap out travel bugs as I was going through, cause it was always full. That's, that's really cool. That, <laughs> wow. I, <laughs> now I really want to hope that that's, that's going to be on my caching bucket list now is to go down and check that out. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. And like I said, there, I have a video of it on, on my channel um, called freedom go boom. Um, and it's, it's, it was a lot of fun. He, like I said, he's got a ton of gadgets in the area. And a lot of them are based off of West Virginia Tilm. So if you don't ever make it up to West Virginia, there's a lot, you can go down to Savannah and do them around there and then head up to Charleston. And there's a, one or two of my gadgets are still up there in Charleston right now. I have some family down near Atlanta. I may just have to plan a visit to go see them next summer and do a little caching while we're down yep. that way. That would be, yep. oh, that sounds really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight and, and talking with us. I really appreciate it. Got a lot of great info on gadget and creative caches from you. We will definitely have a link to your blog in the show notes, and we'll definitely have a link to the cache highlights, and I will have to find that specific video for that cache highlight to include on there, because I think people are definitely going to want to check that out. Yeah, it was a lot That's of fun. Great. And thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun, and... Uh... Thanks for doing this and thanks for doing everything you are doing for the geocaching community. Well, thank you. And I definitely keep those vlogs coming. I've been really enjoying those videos since I discovered you on Facebook. So thank thank you. you for putting all those together and showing us so many different cool caches that you can make. Thank you. You've been listening to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Do you have a topic you'd like to hear discussed? Do you have a geocache adventure you would like to share for the cache highlight? Would you like to be a guest on the show? Reach out to me at geocache.adventures.podcast at gmail.com or on the contact page at geocacheadventures.org. You can also check out Geocache Adventures merchandise by visiting the store page at geocacheadventures.org. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed the show.